The governor on a visit in the area decided that the people living in and around the Juru country needed closer police supervision. He declared a new settlement. It was named the Whole River Aboriginal Settlement. John Kenny was a protege of Roth and adopted a lot of his theories. He was made superintendent of the settlement. Finally, the settlers had a way of controlling the Juru people. The farmers had access again to cheap labour. The churches had in some cases exclusive access to the people and a way of preventing them from practising traditional beliefs. The government had a way of funding the welfare of the Aboriginals and silencing the people outraged by the atrocities perpetrated on them. The general public was happy because it appeared to solve the problem and they no longer saw the deprivation in their towns and districts. Unfortunately for the Juru, it was a different story. Before the settlement was built, they were free to roam the district as long as they maintained good relationships with the settlers. They were free to speak their language, practice their rights, and gather what traditional foods they could find. They were free to marry and free to stay in their family groups. For them, protection from the ravages of life outside the settlement was to be replaced with ravages from inside the settlement. Initially, people went willingly to the settlement, but as the rules and restrictions became clear to them, they refused to go. They tried to escape and hide in different districts. There were fewer and fewer places to hide. Often in shackles, they were forced into servitude at the settlement. The institutionalized incarceration of Aboriginals had begun in earnest. A resident of Cardwell described one scene in a letter to the editor in the Townsville Daily Bulletin on Thursday the 17th of June 1915, titled Police Raid on Cardwell Blacks. Sir, so, at early morning on the 30th of this month, the inhabitants of our here too quiet peaceful little town were aroused to indignation by witnessing our local blacks, chiefly old men, women and small children, some 40 people all told, being marched through town by a squad of mounted police armed with rifles. When some of these blacks would have deviated from the roadway to speak to a former employer, they were ruthlessly driven back and onto the police barracks, where they were yarded like a mob of cattle, some being placed in the lockup, and the remainder were kept under strict surveillance until the following morning, when they were again escorted to a waiting boat at the jetty. They were thrust aboard and shipped to the mission station opposite Dunk Island north of the Hull River. Ever since the idea of this mission station was first mooted, these Cardwell Blacks have dreaded the idea of being sent there. For some time they have feared a raid upon them, and although the weather has been cold, and their annual supply of blankets were lying at the police barracks some weeks since, they would not come forward to ask for them. Finally, about the 6th of the month, it is stated, our local representative of law and order sent these blankets back to the war, from whence they were to be shipped away. Somewhere then the blacks, in fear of losing their blankets, bestirred themselves to activity. Mr. Denham, Premier at the time, chanced to be in Cardwell, and a deputation of blacks headed by King Charlie waited upon him. It was a gigantic effort of intellect for these blacks, and one gin fainted in the ordeal. But they managed to make the Premier understand that they were losing their blankets, and that they had been born and lived their lives in Cardwell and vicinity, and they wished to end their lives there in peace. Mr. Denham assured them that they need not fear being forced away to the mission station, nor would they be in any way molested, and that they might come in on the following morning, and they would be given their blankets. He would arrange that the blankets were then returned from the jetty to the barracks. While well, Mr. Denham left Cardwell that night, and the next day a squad of blacks rolled up for their blankets. But it's reported that only two or three were served out to them. The next day, after a bitterly cold night, a gin with a two-month-old baby told me she had to cover it with her dress to keep it warm. It was a week later before anything worthy of the name of a distribution of blankets was made. The Cardwell Blacks have been an orderly, sober and steady working people who ask nothing but to be left alone to sign agreement or work per day 
with a would-be employer. Several residents have watched many of them grow up from childhood and have known them half a lifetime. These people confirmed the words of Mr. Denham stating that their big fellow master would not lie to them and they might assuredly rest free from fear of molestation. Had they not trusted to the promise, the tribe would have hidden in the mountains practically beyond the reach of the police. Local indignation has run high over the above affair as it is looked upon as practically kidnapping. Blacks present on the occasion say three shots were fired over their head before sunrise on the 30th of the month. A few bolting escaped into the cordon and took to the bush. The police are not necessarily at fault. They were probably carrying out duty as directed, but a fault certainly lies somewhere. Coercion should not have been used. These blacks are not criminals. These blacks generally prefer freedom to signing agreements. But for some weeks we have been informed by the local police that they could not be signed on in Kabul. And employers must apply to the man in charge of the Hull River Mission Station. Well one man did so and was referred back again by the man in charge to the Kabul police. Hence bandied about, he let the matter drop. As did others who otherwise would have signed on those who had worked for them on and off for years. Finally when the erection of a mission station north of the Hull was first mooted, Kabul people welcomed the scheme, for it was stated that the object was to make a home for sick, aged and infirm blacks that required one. And further that opium eaters and smokers among the Chinese on the Tully River would be interned and treated for their own benefit, while women and children now in the toils of the yellow man would be rescued from a fate worse than death. We are accustomed to associate the word mission with religious protection and the teachings of Christ, not as a fit name for a slavery mark, and it would mean nothing short of this if a free people, under the protection of the British flag, are to be seized against their will, rounded up by the police and shipped there by force whether they will or not. The action seems worthy of a bullying German would-be autocrats in Belgium than the decree of a paternal government that claims to protect the helpless, untutored Aboriginal. And I, having witnessed what I have, joined with the local populace in crying shame on the harsh measures adopted. I do not know where the blame of this business lies. Certainly someone should be censored. For the unfortunate blacks, the only reparation that can be offered for their outrage and indignity cast upon them seems to be that they be returned to Cardwell by the boat that they were taken away in. Or at least be permitted to walk away free men and women from the mission station to which they have been forcibly abducted. I have no doubt that each of them would gleefully avail himself of the offer. It was soon discovered that forcing people to work on their own country or locking them up in makeshift camps was not feasible because it was too easy for them to escape. A lot of resources had to be expended recapturing them. A new plan to remove absconders to other districts was implemented and if they continued to run away, the family members would be removed and their whereabouts held secret. Language other than English was forbidden and when the new influx of outsiders entered the reserves, the cultural beliefs became mixed together. The old ways of the Juru, including language and stories, were being forgotten, replaced by English and Christianity being taught to the young people in the schools, while parents were sent to work on the farms. In the space of one generation, many of the Juru children had lost the knowledge to survive on country. The disciplinary actions were designed to reduce the power of the traditional leaders. The removal of traditional leaders and elders also removed the Aboriginal justice system. As darkness fell on Juru culture, threatening to extinguish it forever, a spark remained hidden in places outside the settlement where Juru people met in secret and spoke their stories in their own language. The Hull River settlement was used as a place to send the worst troublemakers. Its remoteness and the natural harshness of the surrounding area were barriers to all but the local tribes. In the first year of its operation, land was cleared for pasture and crops were planted to feed the inmates. Unfortunately, in its second year, an unexpected drought killed off the pastures and food stocks forcing the settlement to again rely on the state for handouts. It proved to be a lean time for the inmates. In 1916 and 1917, 
Malaria is proving to be a huge problem in North Queensland. It is reported to be devastating the population of Aboriginals confined to and grouped in the settlements. The state health system is overwhelmed and the settlements are left to their own devices to tackle the problem. Mrs Kenny, acting as a matron of sort, is in charge of the health of the inmates. The government didn't record the amount of deaths that occurred in the settlements and in the Protector of Aboriginals report for 1917, he stated the settlements had a visitation of the disease and up to one third of the savage native population has been destroyed. At Hull River Settlement, there may have been as many as 200 deaths, according to stories passed down. The dead were buried on a ridge to the north of the settlement. There are reports of over 100 graves, but actual location of the site is still a mystery to this day. What happened the following year might help to explain why. In 1918, and as if it was even possible, the Juru people would suffer the greatest evil. It was not the cyclone that on the 10th of March 1918 crossed the coast at Innisfail and completely destroyed the settlement, including the superintendent's house, killing Superintendent Kenny and his daughter. The cyclone caused a 3.6 metre tidal surge that scalloped out the grave sites and deposited upon the shoreline, a sand dune that filled in a lot of the swamps. According to reports prior to the cyclone, the settlement was being repositioned to remove people from the low-lying mosquito breeding areas due to the amount of suspected malarial deaths that previous year. The married quarters and the single female quarters were placed on the hill, but the single men's quarters were still on the lower levels. There was a stockade also on the lower level and some people were restrained there. It is necessary to remember that the inmates' quarters are huts made traditionally by the inmates, not the substantial buildings which were the staff accommodation. It is impossible to know exactly how many people died in the cyclone. The records of how many people were actually in the settlement were not accurate at the time and many people escaped when the cyclone arrived. Official records say that there were only 12 deaths, but it is likely that there were many more than this. There were reports of people being washed out to sea, but again, it is impossible to know how many could have survived. At the start of 1917, there were around 400 inmates. There were only around 120 left in the vicinity of the settlement when an eyewitness reported on the scene the next day. The eyewitness was Banfield, a writer living on Dunk Island. He reported that Kenny and his daughter were buried near the site on the hill and the graves marked with shells. Time and souvenir hunters have removed the shells and location of the grave sites of Kenny's is still unknown. The Juru know cyclones they don't see them as an evil. To them, cyclones are renewals. The greatest evil they suffered came in the aftermath of the cyclone when it was decided to abandon the settlement and relocate to a new settlement on Palm Island. Removal from country is the greatest evil to inflict on the Juru people. Everything they live for, beliefs, culture, knowledge, stories, all relates to their country. Some lucky few escape into the foothills to be adopted by other groups. On Palm Island, the threat to culture for the Juru is now a complete assault. The new Palm Island superintendent was a man named Curry, who ruled with absolute authority until, in a fit of madness, he killed his family and burnt the store building on the island. He was eventually shot by one of the men on the island. The history of Palm Island is recent and in living memory. On Palm Island before the settlement was declared, there were also people that called it home. As was typical of the government at the time, no Aboriginal people were considered independently 
and the Palm Island people were dispossessed of their land. The influx of outsiders caused riots and violent outbreaks. Tribal groups were disbanded. Language other than English was banned with terrible punishments for disobedience. The different cultures began to mesh together and the Juru language was all but forgotten. The stories lost their power when they were interpreted into English. Because they related to Juru country, the stories lacked context and they too were lost. Christianity replaced the traditional beliefs as it became imprinted on the generations raised in the Palm Island schools. By the time Aborigines finally gained the freedom to leave the island and return to country, the desire to do so had lost all meaning. To a lot of people born and raised on Palm Island, it became the only home they knew. English became their only language and Christianity their only religion. They were completely indoctrinated in the true meaning of the word. And yet, throughout all its 40,000 year history, and the all-out assault on its culture in the last 150 years, the Juru people have survived. The language is being taught again, thanks to the records kept by scholars and linguists, and small pockets of cultural resistance. There are Juru people living on Juru country. The Australian government has given some land rights back to the Juru, and they are practicing and relearning the stories of the past. Juru are again trying to protect the survival of the totems on country and adapting an evolving culture to modern rules. As long as one strong defiant Juru family can stand on country and declare, we are Juru and this is our home, then the Juru can live as a proud individual nation for the next 40,000 years. This is not the end. This is only the beginning. Something we felt far away from this world And there was bottle brush calling us The ocean fire crackling beneath those stars Seven miles that track sent us somewhere Where we could breathe and be ourselves This was the place was the place better than all things left in our shadow long since gone and all we see go we lifted that go no more greedy hearts only lack minded souls and Greedy hearts, only lack and soul. 